question first and then I would want to introduce ourselves because I see many of new participants today here with us. Precision medicine is changing the way we understand and diagnose and treat as well the major life-threatening diseases. And the transformation is driven by high throughput molecular data that is being collected from patients, animal models, and large-scale cell line experiments. In this program, we will explore how the various omics data types generated in these studies can be analyzed and integrated to study the basic biology associated with the viruses and the hosts, cancer onsets and development and the outcomes as well. As I already introduced myself, I'm Sonali Kalri and I'm the Omics Logic Community Manager and I'm responsible for daily interaction with thousands of users that are a part of a bioinformatics community managed by Pine Biotech. So before we start the talk, I would want to introduce us. We are a bio, uh, we are a US-based bioinformatics company who is working with multiple academic and commercial collaborators to develop easy to use analytical tools. And our mission is to make bioinformatics more accessible. Omics Logic research-based training programs are a result of close collaboration between Pine Biotech and numerous academic institutions that have participated in content evaluation, curriculum review, and project design as well. Omics Logic is an international program that is running in five different regions with over 10,000 users around the world. And due to this fast growth, our team is uh, working with uh, local and regional coordinators that are helping refine local program logistics and also leverage our online training resources, adapting them to the needs of students and the researchers around the world. This online program includes weekly sessions with an instructor, online tracking and review of student progress, access to all the resources and materials online for self-paced learning, access to expert guidance and problem solving, educational and research pipelines, and also the domain data analysis on our big data server for 15 days. Let me introduce you to the program mentors. Dr. Harpreet has an expertise in the application of statistical machine learning techniques on biomedical data and the development of prediction tools and databases. And she looks after the curriculum development, bioinformatics and data science course development. Dr. Mohit Mazumdar, as he has already introduced himself, he is an experienced bioinformatician with multiple publications and peer reviewed journals and collaborations in industry and academia. Over the past several years, he has been developing collaborations with universities as a mentor and a project lead for Omics Logic Training and Research Fellowship. We have Dr. Jepaliano Shavis with us. He's a postdoctoral fellow at University of Chicago, and he is skilled in bioinformatics and is an expert in glioblastoma. Now, I would uh, want to pass it on to uh, Ilya Brodsky, CEO of Pine Biotech, to talk more about the program. Over to you, Ilya. Thank you very much, Sonalika, for the introduction and welcome everyone. It's excited to do this uh, together today. And uh, what I wanted to talk about is a little introduction to the precision medicine topic in general, why bioinformatics and precision medicine but also to tell you briefly about what the program is going to help you with uh, when you are joining uh, this training program. So before I uh, go there, our background is we're a technology transfer company and we have a close collaboration with University of Haifa, the Tauber Bioinformatics Research Center, which is a center dedicated to the development of computational tools and algorithms, and also making them available in a use, easy to use way way for many users that do not have an engineering and a bioinformatics background. And essentially the objective of the Omics Logic program that we developed is to help with training in bioinformatics, to enable independent research that is guided by mentors and peer example. We want to develop a community that is thriving and growing and they share a passion for data-driven research and an appreciation of citizen science, which means that not just scientists doing science, but people that are learning about science are also uh, engaged in that process. And then we also want to make sure that we are enabling students, clinicians, and faculty of all backgrounds 
to develop novel independent research using latest technology in life and data sciences, which means to make it more accessible and more user friendly. And so today we're speaking about precision medicine, and I want to briefly talk about why bioinformatics and precision medicine. I mean, if you're interested in precision medicine, maybe you're a clinician, maybe you're a student in biotechnology, uh, maybe you're just interested in applications of data for the biomedical research. And so the question is, well, why bioinformatics? So what we want to talk about today is how essentially the availability of data and high uh, throughput computational uh, resources and uh, computational uh, resources that can analyze and integrate and visualize this data is actually driving a new approach to uh, using data for clinical purposes. And so to describe what that really means, I wanna take a couple of examples and then I'll pass it on to uh, some of our mentors to speak more in depth about their particular examples with research studies they've been involved in. So let's take an example with cancer, right? We know that cancer incidence and mortality is growing. Specifically, it is growing in countries that have already good healthcare systems. They have a lot of research. And the major driving force behind that is the growing and aging population. So the percentage of people that are older, uh, typically that is seen as one of the driving reasons why the number of cancer patients and mortality rates are increasing. Now, how do you leverage the ability of these countries to understand and study these diseases to address such a pressing challenge that is only bound to continue and grow and become more complex in the future? Well, one of the things that is now obvious about cancer is that the earlier we understand that cancer risk is increasing, and the earlier we can detect the specific type of cancer that is developing, we can develop markers of cancer risk and we start addressing that cancer earlier on. And that is a proven way to address cancer mortality and treatment in a more efficacious way. And so this early diagnosis really starts very early and maybe for some cancers, including cancers that children have, this is a very critical point. So we need the ability to screen, but obviously we cannot screen for everything. We need to know what we're looking for. And so the basis of this uh, data-driven and biomarker-driven medicine is really having access to data. And so in the past a uh, couple of decades, I think the major exciting thing that has been happening is that next generation sequencing as a technology has been refined to the point that it is becoming accessible enough and affordable enough. So it is really entering the clinical domain. And so it is entering with this um, diversity and challenge that a technology like next generation sequencing is can bring because essentially next generation sequencing can be used to generate a diverse set of data. And so that brings us to this point of omics data. So why omics data? And as you know, we're called omics logic. So a lot of this program is gonna be focused on omics data. So omics means uh, a collection, a collection of the totality of something. And so it could really refer to a number of different things. For example, we can say phenomics, which is the collection of phenotypes, because really when we look at cells, let's say coming from a tumor or the microenvironment, they have different morphology. They, they have different characteristics that we can define in different ways. And so we can collectively call that phenomics, the collection of phenotypes about a particular organism, cell, or tissue. We can also generate genomic data, right? So a lot of us know about genomic data, genomic medicine, essentially looking for those mutations or finding associations between mutations and specific types of cancer or specific stage of cancer or specific treatments that might be effective or not. So that's called genomics. We're looking at mutations, changes in the DNA. Then there's epigenetics or epigenomics, a rapidly growing field because more and more we're understanding that genomic regulation, what's written in the DNA is also regulated by additional elements like 
histone modification, like DNA methylation, how chromatin is open or closed and how accessible it is and many other factors as well. So a growing area of research that definitely has an effect on cancer as well, because we know that cancer is driven by genetics, but also by the environment. And then transcriptomics, where we look at gene expression, alternative splicing, gene fusion, and many other interactions between mRNA and the mechanisms that are a part of the transla translation mechanism that turns the written genes in the DNA into actual proteins that are being used. And not only is that a useful proxy to look at proteins, but an important view of what are the specific biological processes that are happening right now in a given group of cells, individual cells, tissues, organs, or the full organism. And so what is, I think, exciting about availability of this data is that it provides us with a very detailed view of not only the result, the product of what is in the DNA, but it actually gives us a snapshot of what is being done right now. So if you think about how this affects clinical use, you can imagine that if before we were looking at express proteins, uh, if we were looking at histology, if we were looking at morphology of the tissue and differences in the phenotype, now we can look deeper in inside every single cell and we can actually understand what is going on there right now. So how is this changing cancer treatment? Well, one important factor is, is that it is actually right now changing breast cancer classification as one example. So not only are we looking at uh, the changing practices in the clinic because of next generation sequencing data, but we're actually looking at an active area of research that makes a lot of these clinical approaches to treatment, diagnosis, and prevention of cancer a dynamic area of research. And so we're really looking at now how we can look at histological classification, functional classification, and molecular classification together by integrating multiple types of omics data through omics integration, but also then how to use machine learning on large data sets that we already have available to integrate and make sense of this data in the context of disease classification, but also for individual patients. And I think that's why really we're looking at a, an, an important and a growing role of bioinformatics and informatics and data science in general in this clinical field. So it's really about bridging the early stage basic research using this data to translate this research to practice and understand how different aspects of omics data could be applied in practical clinical situations. Now, that's one level of complexity, multiple omics, multiple types of challenges. But another one is that really we need to connect how this basic type of research really connects to what we see in patients. And typically that means how do we translate insights from patient-derived cell lines to studies that are being performed on animal models, to then the application of that information for clinical tri trials and also into the clinic, which is the ultimate goal of genomic medicine. So a good example of that and how it is changing not only with omics data, but with omics data as well, is this application. And, and here's an, ex an example where we are looking at existing types of cancers. We're looking at new types of disease states that we can identify. And ultimately, instead of approaching that from a typical clinical perspective, we're really looking at a data-driven perspective where we are trying to uh, actually leverage the availability of data. And a lot of that data is available in, in many different repositories. And I'll briefly mention that um, to essentially speed up uh, the, the new uh, development of treatments and uh, clinical applications to leverage that data, treat patients better, develop new or repurpose drugs to treat the disease better, and also to even prevent data by understanding better what are the driving risks behind many of these uh, types of diseases. So as I mentioned, surprisingly, not only is this data available, 
the availability of data is growing at a rapid speed. And so what we see, especially in this pandemic, right, we've seen how the availability of genomic data, not only is it growing in volume, it is also growing in how fast it is becoming available, right? So if you imagine as somebody who is maybe a student or a clinician, you know, where do I get all of this data, right? So there's so much data becoming available every day that we can mine and, and learn from and understand it is amazing that we um, can leverage such expertise and uh, investment of others into generating high quality data sets really generated from, like I mentioned, cell lines, animal models, as well as patients. But the problem is really that we need to learn how to navigate this data, right? So here in this image, you can see uh, this is mapping of reads to the reference genome, right? Every single box right here represents a piece of data. So working with this data and making it useful, really extracting some meaningful insights is challenging. And that is why we can hear about all of these exciting methods, people you know, doing amazing projects and maybe integrating a lot of this data and running all kinds of artificial intelligence on, on it. And the problem is that it seems out of reach, right? It, it is just complex because you have to deal with huge amounts of data and very complicated methods. So how do you get trained? How do you get into something like that? Or if you're already in it, how do you expand your horizon so that you can actually leverage some of these more advanced methods and speed up the process of utilizing bioinformatics to actually ask such questions and do some kind of meaningful work in this field. And so our solution to this is to try and make tools for analysis and integration of this data more user-friendly and to train people with the logic behind how these tools work so that anyone can play around with big data sets, analyzing and integrating them together, asking research questions that make sense and that will essentially help you understand both the data and the computational approaches in a better way. And so what I mean by that is that we built the logic of analysis into the toolkit that we have, and we'll talk briefly about some of the resources that you'll have access to in this program, where the logic is explained in courses and applied in a meaningful way in a computational big data analysis platform that you can point and click getting quickly from raw data sets to structured data sets, developing tests and annotating, annotating them with biological information so that you can quickly go from raw data available on these public repositories to biologically meaningful results. And so this kind of annotation, I think provides us with an opportunity to make complicated methods that ultimately are required to make sense of this data, easily approachable, and we can now take examples from real studies that will allow us to ask these questions and understand what, other, understand what others have done. For example, availability of the Cancer Genome Atlas or the TCGA really is one of those examples where we can source multi-omics data from 12 different tumor types with thousands of patients that have information about their clinical stage, about the different types of tumors, about the different types of treatments that they received, and even comorbidities in many cases, and start asking meaningful questions about how that data could be used to inform the classification of patients, the treatment strategy, the prevention, the risk, right? So all of these important questions could be asked. Not only that, we will also take a look at some examples where cancer studies using patient-derived cell lines could be used to train mathematical models using machine learning and classification to start predicting different classes based on signatures or specific molecular biomarkers. We will also dive deeper into some of the clinical data for risk factors and outcomes. We'll take a look at uh, uh, publications and top journals like Cell and uh, Nature Medicine that actually show us how do people utilize some of these types of data to come up with new computational methods, but also how to apply known bioinformatics approaches that you will learn in this program to extract meaningful insights. So cancer obviously is, is one of those examples. Another example, a type of diseases that we know is uh, 
infectious disease is also a growing area where molecular precision is becoming more and more informative. And I'll give you just a quick example. Uh, we all are hearing about these new variants coming up in different strains of coronavirus all the time. And what we know now is that these strains are defined by mutations, and those mutations have a critical impact on the rollout of vaccines, right? We actually hear about that every day in the news. And it's amazing that today, genomic data is so easy to talk about, even though just five years ago, you would start talking about genomic mutations, and people would just stop listening to you, right? So we live in an era of genomic data becoming more and more uh, relevant to everything that we interact with. And so this application of uh, molecular biomarkers and genomic variants to insights that have a practical public health and also clinical impact and significance is now very obvious. So this program is going to talk about some applications of uh, computational methods to a variety of clinical biomedical research, pharma and biotechnology challenges using big data that is sourced from uh, peer reviewed journals and found in different repositories that anyone can get data from. And it is going to be oriented towards where this field is going. And it's obvious that this field is going towards big data where data mining and classification methods are becoming more and more user-friendly and easy to apply to these data sets. Extracting meaningful signal from that data is becoming easier. But at the same time, what you really need is you need the logic of bridging the gap between the biomedical and the clinical applications of this data to the actual methodology so that the two can be used together in a meaningful way. And so in this program, we're gonna go through a lot of these examples with some also technical practical training that you can get access to, how to perform many of these analytical approaches on our big data analysis platform, including in R and Python, learning from curated examples and then developing a sense of a computational process where you go from raw data all the way to biologically meaningful insight and taking that with you so that you can start developing a, an environment for yourself where you can easily leverage this data for meaningful biological and biomedical research. And so some of the outcomes that we envision for those that are joining this program is to understand scientific literature that describes analysis of omics data, uh, to know how to do basic processing steps for next generation sequencing data analysis with consistent accuracy and meaningful approaches, to perform exploratory analysis and generate a hypothesis from data, to design contrast for statistical tests and prepare data for machine learning, annotate found signal using biological data sets and references, identify appropriate data sets for answering a biological question, how to plan a bioinformatics analysis from start to finish in an independent way, and then how to present a project proposal, including the rationale, the methods, scientific background, and anticipated results. And so this, if this is relevant for you, and, and I wanna mention that we've previously had um, hundreds of people finish this program and really taken away meaningful training skills that they could later apply to a variety of challenges that they face in their own research. And so that includes uh, many different participants of different backgrounds, including high school students that are ambitious and want to get into a program with an advanced project that they can present, includes undergraduates that are learning something relevant and really want to get ahead and maybe want to prepare for their master's studies or they want to go into a more data-driven field. That includes PhD students and postdocs that are now engaged in different types of data analysis projects and they need the skill set and the tools and resources to make their understanding of that project more data-driven and apply these tools in a meaningful way. And of course, researchers and faculty that are also trying to leverage bioinformatics to make their research more impactful. 
So now I would like to uh, pass it on to uh, Gipoliano Chavez. Uh, he's going to be one of our mentors in this program that you will be able to interact with. And if you are interested in developing a research project, uh, work with him on that part of it, but also hear from his experience in research. And I know that Gipoliano, you come not from a bioinformatics background, you actually learn bioinformatics as you were getting interested in uh, your research topic. So I'm excited to have you here and maybe you could share a little bit more about your research interests as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Elia, for this very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. You all see my screen, correct? Okay. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. I, I think I said your name incorrectly. It's Elia. I'm sorry. No problem. So good morning, everybody. My name is Gipoliano. Um, currently, I am at the University of Chicago. And I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit today about the challenges that I face on my research. And really, uh, based on what Elia said, that I do not come from a bioinformatics background. Uh, I want to give you an idea of how you can get introduced to that and how you can get started with that. So to start, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about my uh, mentoring experience. I have been a mentor at this point in the summer internship program at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where I, where I got my PhD from. I was a mentor there for five or six years. And in the right part here, you can see that I not only mentor high school students, the SIP, the SIP uh, public, uh, the, the cohort that of students that uh, used to um, take part on the summer internship program is basically formed of high school students. But it is, it is really, really great to also mentor and have the opportunity to interact with uh, the early educational uh, students at uh, UCSC. My, my son is actually part of this cohort here when we were uh, touring them and showing a little bit of uh, science of what uh, what it is to be a science, what it looks like to be a scientist. And so it was really, really nice to have these kids interact with the lab. So with all this experience, I think it's uh, very important to have a sense of community for the human development uh, in any area that you work in anything that you do. And uh, particularly in this field that uh, we are at, the, uh, the, the bioinformatics field, it is also important to teach uh, kids and adults computational concepts because it's a form of investment in their lives. As we said, I come from uh, an undergraduate background where I didn't have an exposure to uh, computational programming. So it's uh, really important to provide uh, people with that type of training in a field of science that in my, uh, in my mind, and I guess many of you would agree with me, is so needed these days. So for many of us, uh, and for me, particularly a computational algorithm is a thing that uh, I never used it to think. Five years ago, for instance, before, before that, I never used it to really think about what a computational algorithm is. But really today, I would like to give you a very, uh, general idea of what a computational algorithm is. It is a basically a set of rules uh, to be followed in calculations to obtain uh, results from uh, as an, an output from a given input. So you basically have some sort, some piece of data, you give it to a computational algorithm and you get a result out of it. And thank you, Elia, so much because you uh, talked about this concept of classification, how it is so important in cancer and in these advanced uh, genomic studies. But really, I like to start from the very uh, simple principles of, uh, of science. And I guess we have been using these, uh, some sort of classification for a really, really long time here. This example of classifying, for instance, animals so we can, for instance, think about classifying the animals based on their number of uh, feet. And I hope I'm saying that correctly in English. So here we have animals with two feet and here we have those animals with four feet. And this is a system of clustering or classification. I, we, we could argue that, uh, in, that in that regard, a uh, classification system, 
like classifying the animals by their species is a more refined way of classification uh, compared to clustering. But really, we are talking about uh, grouping uh, subgroups based on uh, similarities that they have. So how can we get started with uh, this computational classification, I would say, that we are so interested in? First, I would say it is really, really important to identify a problem, as I am going to tell you, the problem that I work with is cancer, particularly neuroblastoma, which is a pediatric cancer. Um, uh, the other thing that I would say is important is to identify a sponsor, so a mentor, a school or a group, a science group that you might be interested in. And uh, really the, what you need is someone or an institution that has the potential to guide you through the process. And frankly, I joined Omics Logic a couple of weeks ago. I'm still getting used to all the resources that they have, but so far, I think the resources that I have seen and have tested and used, they, they're very, very valuable resources in the bioinformatics field. So I said that it is important to identify a problem that you're interested in. And the one that I, I told you I am interested in is neuroblastoma. It's a complex or polygenic disease. Uh, I'll not go too much into details, but I want to say that it's a problem in the development of the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is this part of the nervous system that connects organs to the central nervous system here in the spine, for instance, as you can see. The other problem that I want to go to in neuroblastoma is this concept that we have two major populations in the tumor. So we have the whole mass of the tumor. Uh, there, we could argue that there are many subpopulations, but I'm going to talk, tell you about the two main subgroups, the two major populations, which are the population of adrenergic cells that look actually like neurons. That's why you, you see these projections from the cytoplasm of the cells, making them really look like neurons. And we have the mesenchymal cells, which do not have these progression, uh, these projections. They are not. Uh, they do not adhere. Sorry, they adhere very tightly to substrate. That's why they have this name of S-type, which means substrate adherent. But the difference between these cells is that the adrenergic cells are really differentiated and the mesenchymal cells are not differentiated. Uh, you can also think of them as cells with a uh, stem, stemness potential very high. So these mesenchymal cells are not differentiated. They are not sensitive to chemotherapy. They do not die upon chemotherapy. And they lead to this concept of minimal residual disease, which is the concept that after you give uh, chemotherapy treatment to uh, the cells, the chemotherapy is going to kill the adrenergic cells, but not the mesenchymal. And the mesenchymal cells have the ability to differentiate into adrenergic cells. And that there we have a problem because the chemotherapy is not going to kill the cells. And so there is a chance that the disease is, uh, is going to come back. And uh, when the disease progresses or relapses, there is an enrichment of the mesenchymal cells. It is really important to classify uh, neuroblastoma tumors. And I'm going to give you a more detailed idea of what that looks like. It's really important to classify the tumors into adrenergic or mesenchymal because that has a potential for prognosis. But so far, uh, I mean, that's the part of research that I do. Uh, here, this uh, slide shows you what uh, really the ultimate level of uh, prognosis is in neuroblastoma. So uh, a neuroblastoma tumor is really classified uh, into high risk and non-high risk neuroblastoma. So the high risk has a very lower survival probability compared to non-high risk. And really one important problem is that after a child is, the tumor of a child is classified as a high risk neuroblastoma, there are no methods to determine whether that disease will progress or not. So measuring, as I said, the mesenchymal cells may provide prognostic ability to the research. And mesenchymal cell quantification can be done by sequencing of epigenetic profiles. 
So clustering consists on the identification of homogeneous groups among a set of heterogeneous items. Uh, in the specific case of neuroblastoma, what I try, what I do is I classify cell lines or tumors based on their gene expression profiles. The other thing that I have worked with is classification of SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2, uh, based on their mutational profiles. You would agree with me that mutations are important in cancer and are also important in uh, COVID-19. So for neuroblastoma, this is an example of what's going on right now in the field, because what people try to do is to classify these adrenergic cells and the mesenchymal cells. This is a machine learning method called hierarchical clustering. So we can basically separate, classify, or clusterize the adrenergic and mesenchymal cells. We can do the same using um, what, what are called wet lab methods, such as a Western blot. This is a uh, biochemical method of protein quantification. And you can use uh, some scoring systems to classify adrenergic and mesenchymal cells based also on their gene expression profiles. This image here in the right is a similar method. This is also a hierarchical clustering method, but this is based on uh, enhancer, enhancer peaks or enhancer, cis regulatory regions, um, the enhancer regions that we use to uh, classify or differentiate the adrenergic and the mesenchymal cells. So what I do currently is I basically score tumors. So what you see here in the left are 498 tumors classified with a high mesenchymal score, uh, top high, second highest mesenchymal, stock, high, highest mesenchymal score, third highest mesenchymal score, and fourth highest mesenchymal score, which is the, basically the lowest mesenchymal scores. And what we can uh, demonstrate or see is that uh, tumors with high mesenchymal scores, they have a lower survival probability. Here I'm looking at all risks, but there is some evidence that when I look at the high risk cohort, that cohort also has a lower survival probability. And so this is showing some evidence that the classification of tumors based on their epigenetic profiles may allow uh, some prognosis analysis in high-risk neuroblastoma. And this is very important because, as I said, for high-risk neuroblastoma, there is no such a prognosis system yet. And that's what we're working with. So I am going to end now my talk by showing you one thing that is really interesting, in my opinion, which is the fact that we can compare these very different types of diseases. On the right, I have a heat map of um, neuroblastoma. This is using the uh, RNA-seq profile of neuroblastoma. Uh, sorry if I said this is the left, this is the right, the right image. The in the left side here, we have a heat map showing the mutational profile of COVID-19. So with the high school students that I told you, we developed this uh, classification system uh, of COVID-19 based on the mutational profiles. So here, what's interesting to note is that by looking at the frequency of these mutations, we see some sort of clusterization of the mutations that are in the uh, extreme or extreme east of the earth, such as uh, the samples collected from China, also present in the bat and the pangolin, which are, uh, which are thought to be the animals that are um, more permanent hosts of, of the virus. So really here, what I want to say is that uh, computational biology methods allow us to compare or to uh, have a sense of common analysis that can be done in, in two completely different diseases, such as neuroblastoma and COVID-19. So in conclusion, as I said, bioinformatics can be used to study and understand these two very different diseases and many other types of different diseases as uh, we saw in, during this presentation. And more specifically in my case, bioinformatics may allow the development of prognosis system for high-risk neuroblastoma. So uh, I would like to end now. Thank you so much for listening and for the opportunity to talk here. Thank you so much, Dr. Gipoliano, for, yes, sorry, thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Zebaliano, for uh, you. sharing uh, your research work. It, uh, it really sounds very interesting. Now, I would want to uh, welcome Dr. Harpreet, our mentor for the program, to please introduce herself. Over to you, Dr. Harpreet. Uh, Nalika, can you give me some time? Actually, my system is a bit hanged. Yes, ma'am. Sure. No issues at all. Uh, Dr. Mo, uh, now I would want to ask Dr. Mohit Mazunda to please uh, share the session details. Uh, okay. Thank you, Snalika. And hello, everyone. So, um, before I sh share the session details, I'd like to thank uh, Ilya for this excellent overview and um, uh, it helped us learn a lot of new things and uh, Gio Pilano also for the uh, introduction to the uh, to the research uh, now uh, i'd like to share my screen to show you some of the resources that are associated with the program and uh, it's just for everyone i think uh, because uh, we do hear uh, about some of the confusion that are there with all the resources that have been shared. So I just wanted uh, all of us to go through some of these resources and to understand where to find uh, the, the things that we discussed today. So this is the pre-registration page where we all started and like many of you have pre-registered here. So in this page, uh, we have a, a video overview and then we have the session details. Um, along with that, there's a form that you have, many of you have filled up and then we send out the emails. So uh, when you uh, go through this page and uh, you would want to learn more about the sessions. So the second thing that I would like to take you to is the program syllabus and how we have planned the live sessions and the resources that are associated with it. So one of the exciting part of this program is just, uh, which also differentiates us from other, other similar, similar, you know, online programs is that uh, there are several uh, resources that are associated with each of the programs. So this is the curriculum syllabus page and uh, Sonalika, if you can paste uh, the link of this page too, so that we can all browse through this page. So um, as, as we go to this page, this page actually describes uh, the, the curriculum that we have developed and also uh, the resources that would be associated, including the assignments, the hands-on sessions, and what will be covered in the hands-on sessions. And uh, where would you learn about those uh, technologies and what all Ilya just said about, you know, getting started with, uh, with big data, getting started with uh, gene expression data, getting started with um, uh, genomic data, and then applying it for uh, for cancer problem and applying it for infectious diseases. So there's a lot to learn, and there is so I mean I'm really happy that the, we have all of you to get together today to uh, showcase some of these that we have put together for this program. So there's a video uh, again uh, which gives an overview of what was covered. So you have already seen what was covered. So session wise, when we go to the um, uh, when we will start, which would be on Tuesday. So we are going to start next uh, Tuesday uh, at uh, 9.30 a.m. CST. I think it's 10, 10 a.m. CST. So yeah. So in the first session, we will be covering about bioinformatics and translational oncology research. So this would be the overview of, uh, uh, of the cancer problem. As we were discussing, we will discuss about the complexity in the sense of how it is being described in at tissue uh, organ and uh, you know cell, cellular level. And then the molecular factors that actually uh, are associated with tumor development, growth, and metastasis. Then we will understand that the how how genotypic and phenotypic relationship uh, can be identified through these clinical and molecular data types. And the, then we will go through the uh, the overview of the platform and what we will be doing throughout the course. So this will be on the on the on the first session, which will also be an available uh, to all of you. And uh, the the associated online resources, as I was telling you that um, at we started off with uh, the learn site. So let me go to the learn site. This, this is the associated 
associated courses that are available on the learn site so um, if you have not created a login for yourself so please uh, do that uh, this is the link and uh, let me show you how you can do that it's very simple and this is also for to, uh, to uh, also for those who would not uh, who would who are participants who would be participants and also for those who would think about joining later but uh, you know it's great to have you here it's a free login so you can just log in with your email address or your social media address so i'll just sign in so once i sign in um, i'll come to the home page i'll just show you how to navigate through this website so once you come to the home page it describes all of what we described uh, and talk, discussed today as well as uh, what are different specialization that you can opt for. So we have specializations in oncology, infectious diseases, neuroscience, agriculture, and then the TBI info server, and uh, also all of the things that we discussed, our associations. And then uh, the interesting thing about the syllabus is that we will in start with introduction to bioinformatics. So let's go to our first course, introduction to bioinformatics, which will be covered in the first session. So in the first session, we would want to learn, uh, we would all want to learn about where bioinformatics can be applied, uh, especially in biomedical research. So all the areas that you might be interested in, you will be able to navigate through this. And this, uh, this course also has a form which let us, uh, uh, let, let us uh, know more about you, about your research interest. So this is a course that I recommend you all to take and it's a free course. So once you create your login, your, uh, your free login here, you can start taking this course uh, uh, after your login is done and you have a profile. So let me sh quickly show you what a profile is profile looks like. So this is my academic profile. I have a p image and uh, I have, uh, I've described myself. So one of the benefits of having a profile is that uh, you will be able to see your progress, how many courses you have finished, how many programs that you are enrolled in, and also like uh, what are the, as I said, that what are the courses that I'm enrolled in, I'm doing, and what are the programs I'm enrolled in, and I'm like interested in going through, and then the certifications that I've uh, that I've gained from uh, taking the courses, these courses, or completing the programs. So all of this you will gain and get from this uh, profile once you just create a free profile here and put some of the information that would help us learn more about you and also like uh, uh, like also uh, people who are interested to collaborate with you or people who are interested to hire you for uh, any uh, specific research work. So all of that is uh, actually uh, are the components of having uh, the profile. So this I would really recommend you to all of you to uh, create and uh, at least go through the free resources that are available with all of the sessions. So as I said that the first session that would be about introduction to bioinformatics and introduction to cancer. The second session is more technical where we dive into uh, genomics. So uh, in genomics, we will learn about next generation sequencing. We will learn about how we can in, uh, how we can analyze genomic data and find out those uh, variants uh, and those variations and those mutations, significant mutations. So again, uh, there is a bunch of courses that explains uh, genomics and uh, uh, one of the benefits of doing this is not just that you would be able to learn from the very beginning, from the very basic, starting from the DNA structure, but also you will have an option to work and learn R and apply R or Python uh, using our uh, coding playground tutorials. So here uh, you, I will show you another demonstration where you will able to also apply data science techniques. So about genomics, uh, you will be also go, be able to go through the hands-on sessions and the hands-on sessions with uh, the star mark are the ones that are available to the participants and also to, to those who would want to subscribe for the asynchronous material. So uh, when I click into this, I'll get information about how I can prepare my pipeline and understand about the process of creating a pipeline and what are the components that are involved. Uh, so once you complete, this is like uh, an achievement that I've gone through this tutorial and I have gone through this tutorial, so uh, but not uh, yet on the platform. So here you will also learn about the data sets that are embedded in the 
uh, with the link that you will get. So these are all the benefits of uh, getting to the, uh, the asynchronous material and going through the tutorials. And uh, that goes from, you know, basic introduction to building up variation, variant pipelines to do a phylogenetic analysis and again, uh, go through uh, multiple sequence alignment uh, to see the variation and evolution of genomes. So uh, obviously there are so many applications which I cannot list out uh, in this session. However, uh, the second session and uh, the third session after the second session learning about genomics would be about transcriptomics data, so gene expression data. Here also we will go through uh, the, an overview of how you, uh, I mean, what is the significance, what is RNA sequencing, why it is done, um, its history, and then about its... Uh, application that how do you do it and uh, like get uh, understanding about the quality of the file that are available and then how do you pre-process the data map it to the genome and going through all that uh, process so we will be doing this on the tbianfo platform so just let me quickly um, go to the tbianfo platform so sorry about this this is a different pipeline so this is the TBA Info platform, uh, which we discussed in this meeting and uh, which is a really amazing platform, which is a very comprehensive as well, describes uh, all of the NGS data, uh, data types and uh, shows us uh, very elaborated methods and pipelines to uh, you know, analyze this sort of data. So uh, this is a typical pipeline. This is how it looks. And uh, one of the best part of this is that it's uh, the entire platform is very, uh, you know, friendly because it describes all of the processes, all of the data types that are there and uh, what are the applications that we can do with this. So when we go into this section, this is about transcriptomics and I was discussing session uh, about the transcriptomics. So here uh, we will be going through the, uh, the example data sets that we have compiled for you and learn from. So this is a pipeline which has already uh, inbuilt data sets which are put together and you will be learning about those data sets in the session. And then we will be going through the pipeline together, building a pipeline, how, how this you know, format makes sense, why these, uh, these are placed in this manner. So uh, the flow is that that uh, these algorithms are placed in i know many of you are already aware of this but for those who are not are in a logical manner put together in a logical manner where we start from pre-processing the data to then error connect correction then maybe mapping it to the genome or, or you know uh, doing isoform construction or doing uh, mapping it to the transcriptome or doing differential gene expression. So there are several experiments. I mean, you can build from different uh, paths that you can take to analyze your data. So in this, uh, in this session, we will be learning about the breast cancer sample cell lines that we discussed and the publication that is associated with the session. So I think I can, I can go about it uh, a little bit more, but I, I think we don't have that much time. But coming to the part where we will be discussing about uh, the application, and there was a question about classification and uh, clustering in the chat. I think um, it is something that also I would love to talk more and more about, but we already have a session described uh, for this, where we will be going through machine learning. And in this, we will be uh, applying gene expression data uh, and finding patterns from the gene expression data. So uh, in this process, we will be applying um, machine learning methods using the TBAN for server, obviously. So we have uh, those very well defined in these sections of data mining. So you will be able to do clustering and PCA and uh, also if network, uh, uh, but yeah, you can start with all of these methods or uh, when you start with uh, the program and also like uh, to those who are joining uh, i think it's great to start with the coursework and get a glimpse of uh, uh, the sessions before actually the start of the program so now i would also want to tell you more about a uh, little bit of machine learning in biomedical data and data science uh, so how, what is the data science aspect so um, sorry let's go back to the courses and let me search for data science. So we have a lot of data science courses. And one of the example I would want to show you is that introduction to data science for R. So here we have a lot of tutorials uh, that you will be able to go through and it's relevant to the session. 
so we will be going through some of the visualization techniques uh, how would we do pca and come uh, using our code so as you as i as i said that uh, um, our studio is uh, is uh, available here on the browser so you can actually learn about the problem here and then uh, learn about the data that is available and then uh, the 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 commands uh, where it is described what it 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 explains like uh, what data set that we are ta taking what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, step that we are doing so here uh, once you learn about these steps and learn about what will be done with the data you will have an opportunity to do it do it yourself so uh, here's a big tutorial So learning about all these techniques, uh, going through the assignments, and you'll be able to run it yourself. So this is a code block where uh, this uh, you can run the scripts by learning about the scripts and then actually uh, doing it yourself and getting results. So for the data sets that uh, maybe our researchers are working on, our research fellows are working on, they're utilizing these, these tools to come up with uh, uh, with uh, images and uh, for presentations and publications, etc. So this was about uh, that. And then the fifth session is about oncology, where we will be learning about the data, uh, sorry, oncology data sources. So it's more about the data repositories. So we will be going to NCBI. We will be looking at the data sets that are available there, learning from them, uh, taking some of them as examples and understanding how they connect. I mean, how do you annotate your results better? So how do you annotate your mutations? How do you annotate what in information that we are got, getting out of the machine learning after the machine learning analysis. So this is the first phase. Uh, after the first phase, second phase is all about infectious disease problems. In this, we will be learning about viral genomes and host transcriptomes. Uh, so we have also a virology sections that will be utilized in this program. Uh, so, um, so going back to that. So here we will have example projects in this time. Uh, from this part, you will start working on projects. You will have an opportunity to start working on projects. So these projects are asynchronous projects that you can take any time. And uh, you will have an opportunity to work uh, them through when you have uh, 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 availability. And uh, these are like very descriptive projects that describes, uh, I mean, these are some of the data sets that are described by publications. And uh, we have put together, how do you analyze and uh, understand from what uh, the authors have described? So uh, these are some of the example projects. And then we will learn about uh, genomic uh, multiple sequence alignment and phylogeny. And we have another few projects like COVID-19 and Ebola. So these are again about the mutations and uh, how, how COVID-19 or, I mean, this is from a paper uh, that describes the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2. It was published in Nature Medicine 2020. Um, so yeah, you will learn about go this. You can learn from this project as well, along with the session. So these are the live sessions that we will be covering. And along with that, there are always uh, asynchronous material available for you to take throughout the week. And then we will go through project examples where we will learn how to compare. Uh, and I mean, these are different biological questions that we are asking from the data so that you get an experience of how can you ask your question from your uh, research? So again, like after learning about all of this, uh, the uh, last part of the session, the 10th se session is about host pathogen interaction. So here we will learn and connect uh, some of the aspects of our uh, omics data to structure and uh, you know finding those key mutations and understanding those and uh, then uh, the effect of what it caused for the function of the protein so this is what uh, is planned for this uh, precision medicine program and i hope that uh, i've been able to uh, describe this well to all of you and i'll be happy to answer any questions that you have And also, I wanted to add that uh, signing up on the Learn <coughs> Portal 
patislearn.omicsproject.com would get you the automatic access of the TY info server as well, which Dr. Mohit just shared. And uh, yes, so we also share, I, I would be mailing you all the details which were uh, discussed in this session and also would give you the links and how you can proceed further with your submission. Right. So thank you, Sonalika. I just wanted to add a couple of things. So we also have a Slack channel and I forgot to mention about the program uh, part. So yeah, when you go to learn and when you do this login, you'll be able to go to this tab programs. So in programs, we have all the programs listed out that are upcoming or have been ongoing. So you will find precision medicine here. And to register for this program uh, with live sessions and everything, not just the asynchronous material, you have to start your application. So using this link, and once you start your application, you can select different options. So these options involve all the cloud access. So there are five terabyte of space that would be allocated uh, and uh, you will be able to run the cloud pipelines and then the coding sessions. All of this is included in this, uh, in this, uh, in this pack package. And here uh, you will be also able to apply some of the um, discount codes or uh, some of the fee waivers that have been uh, provided by Sunalika. And also for lower income countries, we have a scholarship option that is also available. And I would like to request those who are applying for scholarship to do it as soon as possible, because we are going to start the program on Tuesday so we can process your application by Monday. So I would also request Sonalika to share the scholarship uh, scholarship link. So there are different access uh, levels, so different licenses. Uh, another license is about the intermediate step, step where you would want to have an additional one-on-one -on -one mentor support where you would want to go through some of the materials along with the mentor, ask your research question. So even in this entire program and even in the webinars that we do, uh, it would be really nice to discuss your research question, but yeah, obviously there's a limitation of time, but when you are in one of the programs, then it would be, uh, it would get a, give us like a lot of time for uh, you with you to discuss your research and work on your idea. And if we can utilize these resources to be able to come up with the research outcome. So uh, the research part uh, is uh, also being in this advanced license. So it gets you to work on your own project and additional uh, month of uh, uh, cloud access. So this is the advanced license. And then obviously there you will have access to a lot of courses. And then once you go into the sessions and like register for the program, you will uh, be able to see uh, a different interface. Uh, so I'll take you there. Um, but you will also be able to come up and show, it will also be able to get your certificate as I showed you earlier. So this is the registration part. And along with this, uh, now let's, let me show you, I'm not registered for this program. So I would just want to show you another program and uh, the interface. So once you're registered, this is the interface that you get. So you will get uh, the courses that you're doing and all of that, and you can, uh, ask for a Q&A or you can ask for a mentor session and then you'll get your certificates here. And uh, when the sessions are ongoing, you will find the session videos here. So the recording, video recording, you will get into when you get uh, registered and then you will have access to an interface like this. And then you will be able to get the session recordings into this interface so that you wouldn't have to you know, go anywhere. It's the same, same place where you will find all the details. So also the same thing with, for the Zoom link for the next session, you'll be able to find the Zoom link as well. So this is another program that is ongoing uh, for our partners in uh, Louisiana. So it's a, a program with LBRN network. Uh, so I think, yeah, uh, that's it uh, that I wanted to, uh, to tell you all. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. And now I would also like to invite um, also like to invite uh, Dr. Harpreet to tell more about herself. Thank you, Dr. Mohit. Let me share my screen. Uh, answering your question, Vipra, yes, the sessions would be recorded and they would be uh, given the access to all the program participants. Yes, Dr. Harpreet, you may continue. Thank you. Thank you, Sonalika. So, hello everyone. My name is Harpreet Kaur. I have a PhD in bioinformatics. 
So my PhD was in the area of cancer genomics, particularly liver cancer. So my PhD, sorry. So the major areas that I uh, I have worked on during my PhD that was uh, biomarker discovery for the diagnosis and the prognosis of the liver cancer. Here uh, I have mainly focused on accurate cancer prediction, particularly first hepatocellular carcinoma, which is primary liver malignancy, and the second cholangiocarcinoma, which is uh, another primary liver malignancy. Then in the another area where I have worked, that is uh, I have worked to identify important uh, genomics and epigenomics biomarker for the early prediction of HCC patients. In the third, uh, in the next project, I have worked on the area to stratify uh, HCC patients of based on their reoccurrence, that is whether there is a, a low reoccurrence risk or high reoccurrence risk. So in my current role, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in my current role, I'm current column developer and uh, So I'm involved in designing research project and assisting the uh, assisting the participants in their various types of analysis. I'm also mentoring number of the research fellow in their research projects. So I'm looking forward to work with you uh, during this upcoming program. So now over to you, Soralika. Thank, so, thank you so you. much, Dr. Harpreet. Thank you so much, Dr. Harpreet. And uh, Thank you everyone for joining today. And if you have any questions, you may mail me at marketing at the refine.bio. Or you, you can also mail Dr. Mohit at mohit at the refine.bio. And we have shared all the details with you. I, I would be sharing the uh, session recording as well. The webinar, we had to do the recording of the webinar and also all the details, including the program registration page and the pre-registration page as well. And I've shared the mails. If you have any doubts, you, uh, you can ask us. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining.